Welcome back to Zoo 3649 Lecture 30, 26, sorry. And this is the first uh, lecture where we are talking about um, the methods for building trees, okay? In other words, phylogenetic reconstruction. Remember I said phylogeny, tree, and genealogy is the same thing, okay? So phylogenetic reconstruction means reconstructing a tree of the evolutionary relationships between organisms. And why do we call it reconstruction and not construction? It's because the original construction was done by evolution. Okay? What we want to do is reconstruct the evolutionary relationships. We just want to reconstruct what evolution constructed in the first place. Okay? But we don't know what evolution constructed. We need to reconstruct what evolution constructed. That's why we call it reconstructing a tree or a phylogeny. And we're going to be dealing with two non-model methods called distance and parsimony. Okay, so, and when I say non-model, it's, remember, you've, you've already been dealing with models now. We've dealt with a few models in the last section, population genetics, and this is the new other these are the new models in the next two lect three lectures we're going to be dealing with the model ways the way where we use a model to um, work out uh, how to build a tree okay but these are model free methods but nevertheless you're going to have to know them so let us start with traits okay remember when we started this section of genetic structure we started with traits homologous traits analogous traits okay so how do we talk about traits when we are building trees okay well what we do is we call them and and it is not to confuse you but we we call traits characters okay we, and and when the character changes we call it a character state change okay and I will unpack this now uh, I'll unpack this now for you character is nothing more than a trait okay and it's a trait that can be inherited from one generation to the next generation. In other words, it is a homologous mm -hmm. trait because why? It is inherited through common ancestry. Okay, so uh, a character state, character state uh, is usually uh, when a trait basically changes its appearance. For example, hair, okay? Your hair can be either present or absent okay but the trait is hair okay so the present and absent are its different two different states okay so you now you you you, you get the difference between characters and character states okay so if I say uh, eye color is a character state or trait then the character states would be what blue green black uh, uh, brown, all the different eye colors are the different states, okay? What if I said a nucleotide position on an alignment? If you have a DNA alignment, if you lined up uh, um, genes and you have a one position on an alignment, that's a character, okay? And what other different states? It, that character can change from an A to a G, a G to a T, a C to an A. So the character is the nucleotide position on the alignment and the state is either a g c or t okay so you see how dna can also be traits can be used as a trait so the one position on the dna alignment is the trait or the character and the character state is basically the different nucleotides the four different nucleotides it can be okay so i put um up this uh oops my my um picture is right in the way there I put up this here let me move it out of the way for now I put up this uh, this picture here of of how to tell uh, whether a trait or a character remember trait and character we're using as the same word now whether a trait is ancestral or derived and whether it is useful for building a tree or not so these four different trees shows you these uh, what these different character states are okay and apomorphy okay is a derived character so in this 
tree here, the where my mouse is, you can see. We've got these two in black as apomorphies, and everything else is in gray. Okay? The ancestor is this one here. Okay? The ancestor was gray. Okay? Which means that um, the ancestral state, this, the, how the ancestor looked, is called a plesiomorphy. Okay? So if the trait is plesiomorphic, it is the ancestral state. Okay? If it is an apomorphy, it is a derived state. Remember, I said that the first branching is the ancestral branch, and then the rest of the branches are derived. So derived means that it is not the same as the ancestor. It's become different to the ancestor. And you can see here the black has evolved at this point here. And both these have a black character state and not a gray character state. Okay, so it's the same trait, but the state of the character here is gray and the state of the character is black. And the gray traits are the ancestral and the black are the derived. Okay, so a plesiomorphy is then the, the ancestral state and an apomorphy is the derived state. Okay, so remember I was talking to you about ought of ought apomorphies. Remember when I when we were talking about how to make a tree with those with those four lizards and I said if they have a character that is only unique to them, it's called an ought apomorphy. An ought apomorphy is not really useful for, for joining things for joining things in a common under common ancestry, right? So here's an ought apomorphy. Okay? If we had this ought apomorphy here, okay, this ought apomorphy here. And everything else, all the others belong to the ancestral state. Then if we only had this and these four, and not these three here, we didn't know that these three, these three are the ancestors. If we only knew these one is black and, and three of them here are gray, we would not be able to tell the relationships between these here. All we'd be able to do to do is say black is different but we don't know how these three are related to each other that is ought apomorphy okay when there's only one individual in the in the um, tree that has a particular character state okay which is here for example in the lizards it would be the um, the tail spines or the crest of on the other clade yeah, because it was an ought app. Only one individual had it. Those are not what we're looking for. We are looking for these guys here, the sin apomorphies. Okay, because the sin apomorphy is a character which is derived, but it is shared by more than one. And because it is shared by more than one, you can put those two together and say, these two are coming from a common ancestor. The way we could do with the, the markings on the back of the lizard. Or the way we could do with the horns on the other side of the tree. The two lizards that have horns. We could say, ah, it's a sin apomorphy. They share the trait. Uh, let's, a derived trait. Let's put them together. Okay? So sin apomorphies are the very useful ones for making trees. Okay? That's what we're used for. And where are the synop Here's a synapomorphy. So this is very useful. You see, because these two, not like an apple or apomorphy where only one's got it. Here, these two have the black trait. So immediately you can say, ah, these two, we're putting together them together. They had a common ancestor. Okay? Because they we can link them together because they both have this trait. They both share the trait. And the trait is not an ancestor, it's not a plesiomorphy, it's an apomorphy, it's a derived trait. Okay, so apomorphy in the sin apomorphy comes from derived and sin, it just means it's shared. Okay, it's shared. So shared, derived. That's what it, and this, these sin apomorphies are the, are the, uh, are the characters, states we need to build a tree. Okay, and a simplesiomorphy is an ancestral state that is shared by two or more taxa. Okay, so a simplesiomorphy would be, for example, here. This is a simplesiomorphy. These two here have the ancestral state, okay? 
and they are sharing that ancestral state. That's a symplesiomorphy, and this is synapomorphy. Right, now, I want to see how many of you are really thinking, okay? And hopefully by now, I've got most of you thinking. Now, the last, the last, the last example here of character states is called homoplasy, okay? And this homoplasy is exactly the same as something else that we've, that I've shown you, that I've, something else that I've shown you earlier on in our lecture on homology and analogy. Does anybody remember? Okay, what is it? What is it? What is a homoplasy? A homoplasy is a character shared by unrelated individuals. Look at this. These two individuals are black. This one here and this one. They have a derived trait. They have, so we know it's not the ancestral. The ancestral trait is here. The ancestor had a gray. This one has black. This one has black. But they are not sisters. They are not like this. They are not linked. You, you, they are not linked together. Okay? These two are telling us what? That the black of this one and the black of this one does not come from common ancestry. Okay? It comes from analogy. It comes from convergent evolution. That's, that's why homoplasy so basically it is a homoplasy is a what kind of trait it is an analogous trait that that we are trying to make a tree imagine we tried to make a tree with these two traits we would put these two together as sister taxa wouldn't we these two black dots here we would put them together the same way we put together what the flying B bat and the flying bird because they both could fly because flying was an analogous character flying is a homoplasious character you cannot use a homoplasy character to build a tree so homoplasy is another fancy way of saying an analogous character they are the same but they don't come from a common ancestry okay so you got that so Homoplasy, you, homoplasy is telling you that this black ca color evolved twice. You see that? It evolved twice. Okay, so that's, that is where we bring together convergent evolution, divergent evolution, analogous, homologous, synapomorphy, and homoplasy. Okay? You guys need to understand this. And if you don't, please watch this lecture again and again and again until you do. Because your passing this module depends on you understanding this. Alright, I put this sin apomorphy in a, in a red box. Because why? These are the important characters that we need to build a tree. A homoplasy is not what you want to build a tree. Okay? Do not build a tree with a homoplasy. It's the same as building a tree with an analogous character you know you will get the wrong tree. Okay, so that brings us to the very first method of uh, tree reconstruction. And this is the easiest method. In fact, this is the method we used when we built the tree for those lizards. Remember, in the, in the, in the, in the first lecture on this, in this section of the module, we built a tree with lizards, right? Based on characters. We used this principle called parsimony. Although you d I didn't tell you we were using parsimony, that is what we used. Okay? And so this is one way of making a tree. Guys, you're going to be examined on all the ways to make a tree. So you better start taking notes, putting on your thinking caps, because mm, all of this is determining whether you pass or fail this module. So what is parsimony about? The principle is a very, very simple principle. Okay? It says that the best tree is the one that explains the data of the characters with the fewest changes in the state of the character. Okay? So parsimony doesn't want a, a, a character state to evolve independently more than once. Parsimony 
says that a character state, say blue eyes, right? Or let's say in our case, brown eyes, because you and me, we all got brown eyes, right? Let's say brown eyes is the character. Parsimony will say brown, everybody with brown eyes have a common ancestor, okay? Because brown eyes only evolved once. Because Parsimony is, is saying, what is it saying? It's saying that evolution, for something to evolve, is a complicated matter. Things just don't evolve like that. It's a complicated matter. So in other words, for something to evolve, it is more parsimonious. It is more uh, um, simpler to assume it evolved once rather than assuming it evolved twice independently. Like what you would have to assume in a case of what? Convergent evolution and homoplasy. Okay? So, so the fewest character state changes. The theory that has the fewest assumptions is the correct one. Okay? This is also the principle of Occam's razor, which you would have learned in high school. So let's look at these two trees. Okay? Now, it's these two trees are dealing with five species species one two three four and five and it's dealing with one position on an alignment at that position individual one has a g individual two has a g individual three has a t individual four has a t and individual individual five has a g okay now i want to construct a tree based on just this data alone just this data here okay what am I going to say here? I've got this tree. I can make this tree where I have the ancestral being a G, derived being two Gs. But this T, I can say, is a sin apomorphy. And I can put individuals three and four together on the basis that they both share the T. Okay? So in other words, the T evolved here. This ancestor had a T, sorry, a G. Therefore, this guy has a G. This guy had a G. Therefore, these guys have Gs. This guy also had a G. But on at this point where this bar is, the G mutated to a T once. And therefore, both three and four have a T. There's another way to make this make a tree from this very same data here it is it's to assume that okay the ancestor was still g that guy is still g but then individual uh, species four evolved from a g to a t here by itself and then species three evolved from a g to a t here by itself and then, of course, here the G did not change to a T, and both, that's why both of these two, one and two, have a G. So these two trees use the very same data, but only one is correct according to parsimony. And parsimony says what? The tree that describes the observed character data with the fewest character state changes. So this character is this position. It's changed in state from a G to a T. So how can we make the tree so that we have the fewest changes from G to T, right? And obviously it's the first tree that is the, in this one here, right? That is the correct tree because in this tree you ch evolve from G to T once. Remember evolution is a complicated matter. It's, 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 it's less likely for something to evolve independently twice it's more likely that it evolved once and then the common ancestor gave it to two right whereas here in this tree we are saying that the g evolved from g to t here once for species four and again from g to t for species three which is involving two changes whereas the tree the first tree here on the left is evolving one change and therefore by the principle of parsimony which tree is correct only this tree on the left here the one that takes one change that is the correct tree according to the law of parsimony okay that is how you build trees according to parsimony 
what are the advantages of parsimony? Parsimony is, the big advantage is that it's such a simple method, right? I just explained it. How simple is that? The tree with the fewest character straight changes is the correct tree, okay? So that is the simplicity of parsimony. It's, 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 it's so, it's, it's a very simple concept, okay? Unfortunately, it's got a lot of disadvantages, all right? And one of the disadvantages is that um, it is not statistically consistent, okay? And what does that mean? It means that the tree that parsimony produces doesn't always have the highest probability, okay, when we use other methods like likelihood to make a tree, okay? So it's not always the best tree, in other words, okay? Parsimony can be very slow, okay? It takes a long time to run the analysis. <coughs> it's a big disadvantage. Also, uh, depending on how many characters you have and how many times they change state, remember, you need a lot of sin apomorphies to to make a parsimony tree. And if you don't have enough sin apomorphies in your data, right, you might never find the post, pa most parsimonious tree. Okay? You might never find the most parsimonious tree. And the last disadvantage is that evolution may not be parsimonious. It might be a case where you get convergent evolution, like the shape with the dorsal fin, the caudal fin, a shark has it, an ichthyosaur has it, and also a dolphin has it. Okay? If we use parsimony in to make that tree, what would happen? We would get a homoplasy, we will get the wrong tree, because that, the evolution of uh, swimming in water, happened at least three times, independently. Okay? In that case, evolution was not parsimonious. So in that case, if you use parsimony, in that situation, you will get the wrong tree. Okay, so that's what we mean by evolution is not always parsimonious. Okay, that brings us then to our distance-based methods. We're going to quickly go over distance-based methods. And distance, as as you, if you were, uh, have been, um, uh, if you've been um, concentrating, you would see when I was in the last lecture when I was talking about uh, branch lengths, we measured the distance we. I said, well, if you rotate this node, what is the distance between frogs and turtles? Or frogs and turtles, if we rotate it. The distance, we calculated as the, we added the branch lengths up. Okay, that's what distance is. Distance is about the length of the branch. Okay, so the distance method requires a distance matrix. And the matrix is basically giving you a distance between all the individuals that you want to make the tree from. So say you've got four individuals, you would have a, matri a four by four matrix, and each position in the matrix is giving the distance between any two individuals in that um, comparison. And you can use any kind of data to make a distance matrix, okay? You don't have to always use only use DNA sequences. You can use all kinds of morphometric data, isozyme data, microsatellite data, character data. You can use pretty much any, as long as you can measure it. You can use distance to construct a distance matrix, and then you can, based on the distance matrix, you can reconcile that to produce a phylogenetic tree. Okay, so there are two distance-based met methods that we're going to learn in 3649. And that is, the first one is called UPGMA, the unweighted pair group me method with arithmetic means. So UPGMA is the simplest way to make distances. It uh, assumes an ultrametric tree, which means that a tree where all the path lengths from the roots to the tips are equal. Okay, so the distance from the root to the tip for any of the leaf taxa, in other words, any of the leaves of the tree, for if you take the distance from one of the leaves to the root, it's exactly the same as the distance of any other leaf to the root. So all from the root to the tip to the leaves of the tree, the distance is the same for all, for all parts of the tree. 
okay so so that's what you call an ultrametric tree okay and we can construct an ultrametric uh, up geometry from a simple distance matrix so let's look at this distance matrix here this is what i mean by a distance matrix here we have um say four different species species a b c and d and again you have a b c and d on that side and what does this do it gives you the for each pair it gives you a value okay so that means this value of four here the one where my mouse is what value is, that's telling you the distance between which two species it's telling you the distance between species d and species b okay because that's the b column there and the d row okay and so what about species b and species b so what is the distance between species b and species b obviously there's no distance between species b and species. they are they are this identical right so there's no distance between them there's no uh, genetic difference between them so between b and b follow my mouse very carefully my cursor between b and b is zero between a and a is also zero between c and c is also so this diagonal here is all made up of zeros below the diagonal so this here is the distance matrix telling you between b and a c and a c and b d and a d and b and d and c but above the diagonal is what it's the very same distances right so the distance between let's say this one here is between d and b okay if you look at above the matrix you go d and b you also get four okay that four is the same as that four so actually you can block off you can block off this part of the matrix here above the diagonal and you don't lose any meaning because you got the same here or you can block off this part below the diagonal and you've got the same stuff up here okay so how do we make a tree out of this all right it clearly uh, distance um, the distance between a and b is two okay so here's a here's b one two okay that makes a and b two apart and where else do we have a distance of two here c and d that means c and d has a distance of two so we put them together here c and d one two so the distance from c to d to go from d to c is how much one two okay to go from a to b is how much one two from b to a one two okay so from a to b or b to a is two so from d to c or c to d is also two okay so that part of the tree is done but now how do we link the tree up and that we look at the other here the other distance pairwise distance um, uh, distances so what about a and c it's four that means between a and c you need to travel four okay that means the difference between these two linking this node and this node has to be two right because then we can go from a to c one two three four okay and what's the distance distance between a to c is a c four how about a and and d also four a one two three four okay let's go from c to b it's one two three four is that right c to b let's go from c to b there okay it's also four so you see that is how you take a distance matrix and you reconcile it into a phylogenetic tree this tree is unrooted because there is no outgroup okay so all of these there's no we don't we don't know where the ancestor is in this tree okay because it is unrooted all right so that is how oopsie mine i just realized my thing is still up there move it out of the way there right okay so that is how you construct a tree using distance remember there are no character states here there are only these distances and we look at the smallest distances first okay to do the to do the first groupings the a b and the c d the smallest distances then we look at the bigger distances 
So there's no character states here. You don't see, oh, these two have brown eyes. Ah, let's put them together. There's no such thing as that. It's only measurements between different groups. Okay, and these measurements are called distances. All right. So there's also neighbor joining. Neighbor joining is a little bit more complicated way to reconcile a distance matrix. It's based on what we call a star contraction, but you don't need to remember that. Um, it very quickly produces reasonable trees, and it does not give you an ultra matrix tree. Okay, so it actually does the branch lengths of a neighbor joining tree are more in line with the uh, genetic distances between uh, individuals. So it will not be ultrametric, okay? So that the root to the tip will not be the same distance for all individuals. You, in a neighbor joining tree, you can have some in, uh, individuals, leaves of the tree, not all ending at the same place. Some leaves can be long and some leaves can be short, okay? So a neighbor joining tree does not produce an ultrametric tree, but it does produce a very good tree. Okay, so, so let's quickly go through the advantages and disadvantages of the um, distance-based methods. So the advantages would be that it's extremely fast, okay? This is one great advantage of a, of a, of a distance method. Uh, and it's why distance-based methods are still actually quite, quite, quite often used, even in the modern days when we have so many different ways of making a tree. Everybody still uses a distance tree. Why? Because it's fast, okay? And it produces a reasonable estimate of the phylogeny. So you can use another method which takes days, if not weeks, and only to find that it gave you the very same tree that neighbor joining gave you. Okay? So neighbor joining uh, 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 distance methods produce a, a reasonable and fast approximation of the phylogeny. And those are two huge advantages. Okay, huge advantages. And they, you will see the advantages in the next lectures when we're discussing uh, likelihood and Bayesian ways to make trees. They are not fast at all. They are the best ways to make trees, but they're not fast. Okay, it takes a long time to make those trees. And you've got to do many tricks to try and get a tree out of the likelihood and, and Bayesian. Whereas with distance, it's really quick. Okay, so that's a massive advantage. So what are the disadvantages? Well, some of the disadvantages, well, because you're using a distance and not characters, the relationship between the characters and the trees is actually lost when you reduce all characters down to distance, right? So you don't say whether, um, um, you, if, or you can't use a character like uh, whether it has a nose or it doesn't have a nose, okay? That's not a, that's not a, you have to measure the nose, right? So you can't say, does it have a, a bone or does it not have a bone, right? You have to measure this bone. And uh, the measurement of the bone is actually the distance between the two individuals, okay? So um, when, you, when you reduce the characters to, to measurements, you can actually lose a lot of the relationships, um, in, in, in the tree in, in the tree and in interpreting the tree okay and some phylogenetic uh, relationships may produce biased distances like um, for example long branch attractions if you have uh, in a in a distance tree if you have two uh, species which have evolved by themselves for long periods of time but they are not related well sometimes uh, th those long branches can actually uh, uh, distance will, might put them together as sister taxa when they're not actually sister taxa. It's called long branch attraction. So um, that's another disadvantage of distance-based me methods. But in general, they're very fast and very reasoned and, and they produce very good phylogenies in general. But because of the disadvantages, we need to then look at more complex methods, better methods for making a tree. And that is what we're going to be talking about in lecture 27, 28, and 29. Okay, so I'll leave it there for today.